Connor Grennan, author of the memoir Little Princess, spent eight years at the East West Institute, EWI, both in Prague and the EU office in Brussels, where he served as deputy director for the security and governance program. At the East West Institute, Connor developed and managed a wide variety of projects focusing on issues such as peace and reconciliation in the Balkans, community development in Central Eastern Europe, and harmonizing anti-trafficking policy at the highest levels of government in the European Union and the formal, former Yugoslavia. Connor left EWI in 2004 to travel the world and volunteer in Nepal. He would eventually return to Nepal and found Next Generation Nepal, an organization dedicated to reconnecting trafficked children with their families and combating the root causes of child trafficking in rural villages. He was based in the capital of Kathmandu until September 2007, where he was the executive director of Next Generation Nepal. Connor now serves on the board of Next Generation Nepal together with his wife, Liz. He is a 2011 graduate of the NYU Stern School of Business, where he was the president of the, and of course, I don't have the, the rest. The president of <laughs> the student body. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's a pretty dramatic ending. Um, so I'm going to run this slideshow because I think it's kind of neat. Uh, it's just photos. It's not going to actually um, correspond with what I'm saying. If that if that bothers you, I don't know sort of how type A organized you people are here. There's a whole lot of Google jokes that I'll probably hopefully make throughout the whole course of this presentation because doesn't everybody want to make Google jokes all the time? Let me just say actually, so I was in the back of a taxi just now and Garmin was steering us wrong and literally I used Google Maps to sort of get us here with the little blue ball tracking you around. Um, so, so I wrote this book, Little Princes, and I think that when you see um, the cover and when you hear about it and when you read about it or anything else, you get an impression of the person that wrote the book and is going to be speaking and everything else. And sort of the point here is that um, I'm not, I'm not that person, actually, and that's sort of the reason why I wrote the book in the first place, is that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people go out to volunteer and do these things because, you know, they feel called to do it, they've always wanted to help, they're just not sure where to help, they don't know sort of what group they should be helping or anything else. And for me, um, I was going around the world. I was just going to travel, and I was going to have a good time, and I thought, um, you know, this is going to be a great way to segue back into New York, where I was, where I'd been living. I'd been living in Europe for about eight years, and uh, I thought, you know, why don't I travel the world, blow all my money, because I'll never get married and I'll never have kids and everything else, which seemed really reasonable at the time, and you know, and then I'll come home, sort of have a good time. And I told my friends this, and I kind of thought I'd get a lot of like, you know, chest bumps, and you know what I mean, sort of a lot of like, wow, that is just the coolest. You're the man. And uh, I didn't get any of that. I really got more like, wow, really? You're just going to blow all your money even though if you have kids someday, they'll need to go to college? And I'm like, well, you know, of course I'm going to like volunteer. And they're like, oh, you're going to volunteer? I'm like, yes, I'm going to volunteer. So that sort of <laughs> set me off on the track of clearly I need to volunteer if I'm going to sort of bulletproof my way through this year. And the other thing was that um, maybe, maybe you guys don't need any help in this category, but if you tell women that you're volunteering in an orphanage in Nepal. I mean, this is <laughs> like the single best pickup line you will ever have in your entire life. I'm telling you, you can just tell women, they just like swoon, they get all kind of like glossy eyed. Um, and then the problem is you have to actually go and volunteer in Nepal. So I got out there and I realized I really just desperately did not want to volunteer. I mean, I wanted to tell people I wanted, I wanted to tell people I volunteered, I wanted to go home and do that. But I really didn't want to do it, and so um, I walked in and I expected uh, to walk in and find, you know, what I thought was a Nepalese orphanage. And I thought I'd seen enough, I don't know, like World Vision commercials or something like that to know exactly what this would look like. Like, you know, everything is sort of black and white and music is playing, I don't know, like, I mean, you know, just like, and the kids are sitting in a corner somewhere, but it's not, it's like you get this, you know, you get like these madcap crazy kids, because apparently kids are pretty much the same no matter where you go in the world, uh, which I didn't have any exposure to kids in America either, so I had no idea about this, but they're just wonderful kids, and they're sort of jumping all over you, and and it was, it was tough in the beginning, it was, um, like, I, well, I'd never worked with kids, and I'd never been to Nepal, and so um, that was kind of a bad combination. And 
I um, I, mean, I remember like I remember when uh, I was you know trying to tell them stuff about America, and they were like, "So what do you you know what do you eat in America? The, you know is your you know what's your favorite food?" And they all assumed my favorite food was goat because their food favorite food is goat. And I'm like, "No, I don't think it's goat." And uh, like, well, what's your favorite food? And I told them hamburgers, you know, because who doesn't love hamburgers? And uh, and like, oh, that, that's okay. So what, what's a hamburger? You know? And uh, I said, well, it's you know made out of like cow and and I didn't know um, anything about the Hindu religion at the time, but I do now. And <laughs> um, you know, cows are these cows are sacred. Right? And cows, not only are cows sacred, but like, literally, if you hand a cow, look, I mean, look, right? I mean, these cows, they, work, like, they have like tikas on them because they're so sacred. I'm telling them, like, yeah, you know, yeah, cows like that. And so I was basically telling them that like, my favorite food was to like grind up their god, you know, and like, you know, just sort of like eat it. And uh, it, so it got these kids terrified of me from right off the bat. And because uh, I must have seemed like a pretty daunting figure. But you know, in the end, you end up hanging out with kids like this, and you just end up loving them. You know, they're just wonderful kids. And I spent two or three months out there in this little village, and I loved it so much that I actually came back a year later um, to volunteer again. And when I came back a year later, uh, it was it was actually quite different. The um, the Civil War had been going on. Now, so far, sort of these you'll you'll start to see sort of photos of like mountains and stuff like that, so you can kind of just watch as it goes along. But just to understand the environment that I was going into. There was a civil war when I got there the first time. I um, didn't do as much research as I should have done. I kind of bought a guidebook, and I was like, you know what, I'm not going to read this guidebook, because I'm going to 17 countries this year, and every place I go, I'll read the guidebook kind of at the end. I thought this was going to be a really cool plan. Like, oh, at the end, I'll be like, oh, yeah. And so I got in when I came the first time, and I got there, and all of a sudden, there were like all these soldiers and tanks. I'm like, holy crap. So I kind of grabbed the guidebook. I'm like, what's going on here? It turned out there's a bit of civil war going on in Nepal, which is why I should always read the guidebook. And uh, I realized when I came back a year later that it had actually gotten even worse, if that was possible. Essentially, what had happened was the king had declared martial law. He said, we're going to crush the Maoist rebels once and for all. After nine years of this, this is the end. And uh, martial law, you know, at first the people were enthusiastic about this. They thought, whatever it takes to crush the rebellion, that's what we want. And so what the king could do, what was in his power to do, was essentially you know, cut off all free media. You know, he'd throw journalists in jail. He'd throw student leaders in jail. There was this sort of environment. You know, and, and people started saying, like, wow, this actually is not that great. He started um, you know, essentially just sort of crushing any last sort of elements of democracy in the country. He just sort of crushed them. And so that's the environment that I came back into. And I was there for another two months, or three months, and um, one day I was up there with the kids on the roof of the orphanage where you'd stay because that was the only essentially warm part of the whole place. Nepal is a pretty cold country, and you have to stay in direct sunlight in order to stay warm. And this woman comes down the path. And this was sort of unusual already. Not a lot of people came to visit the orphanage. Uh, we were pretty protective of the kids. And as she got closer, I realized that she sort of looked like, and I don't know if this is politically incorrect or not to say, she sort of looked like something out of National Geographic, like her clothes just were different. Even for Kathmandu, she looked very exotic. And she had, you know, like big rings in her nose, and she had, um, you know, giant earrings and everything else. And I was like, wow, this is kind of unusual. And as she got closer, you know, she came right up to the gate and was standing outside the gate, and I realized this woman had the exact same face as two of the kids in our, in our children's home. Two young brothers who were like five and seven years old. Which, you know, was, I mean, it's impossible because these kids are orphans, so we were trying to figure out what could possibly be going on here. Well, she came in and she told us this story, which, which, which I'll tell you now. So she and all these kids came from this very remote part of the country called Humla. And Humla is in the far northwest part of Nepal. Uh, on the border of Tibet, there's no roads leading in or out, there's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no phones, there's nothing. It's one of the most remote parts of the world, I imagine. And this is where the Maoist rebels started to take hold. That's where they started to make their strongholds, because there was no um, rule of law, there were no soldiers, there was no police force, there was nothing. This is kind of a tribal area. And if men come in with guns, that's 
pretty much it. I mean, those are the guys that are going to be in charge. But more than that, they had a philosophy, which was communism. And if communism is ever going to take root anywhere, it's going to be in a place like that, where you know that there's a king out there that has something like 127 residences, and there's incredible wealth centered in the monarchy, and you have your plot of land and your mud hut, and you're just trying to survive. And the Maoists said, we're going to take over, we're going to redistribute the wealth. And so people really got behind this. And as they did, they started to join the Maoist army, the men and the women alike. And they started to, you know, do what the Maoists asked, give them food, give them shelter, give them whatever they needed. Well, this was going on, and the, you know, there was no progress being made. Now, the Maoists were slowly taking over the country, village by village by village, until they had essentially taken over the entire country, except for the Kathmandu Valley, where the king was. The king had essentially barbed wire the entire Kathmandu, the city of Kathmandu. I mean, if you found yourself outside the, the ring road after 10 o'clock, you, you couldn't even get into the city. They literally put barbed wire around the city. We happened to be outside the barbed wire, which was also kind of a scary thing when everybody else is inside the barbed wire and you're outside the barbed wire, like, why do they need to be inside that barbed wire? So what would happen is that when they ran out of the adults to join the army, of course, they would turn to the children, and they'd start taking the children. Of course, the parents didn't want them to take the children, so they said, um, well, no, you can't have my child. So the mouse said, well, we're going to institute a new policy where every family has to give up one uh, child per family. And they didn't really have any say over this. This is all Humla, that place where we're talking about. They didn't have any say over this. So they knew that their children were going to be taken, children as young as five, six, seven years old, because these are the kids that suddenly could do all the washing and the cleaning of the guns and everything else so that they wouldn't have to use soldiers. And so in this environment where the Maoists are taking children, this guy named Golka came through the village. And he was sort of well-known because his brother was a local politician. And he said, look, I have a solution. Why don't I take your child into the Kathmandu Valley? And this is an incredible distance for these parents. I mean, they'd have to walk for about 10 days just to get out of the mountains and take a bus for days, which they couldn't afford, and then take a plane, which they couldn't afford. And this guy was saying, I'll take your child to the safety of the Kathmandu Valley where there's still schools open. Because out in these regions, what the mouse were doing was that as soon as the kids would go off to school, they would go to the school, and they would murder the teachers and take like 80 kids and they said you know we'll give the kids an education and we'll let them grow up and we'll let them um, you know not only get educated but you know come back ready to take care of the village of the family and so parents were obviously desperate for this to happen anything that they could do to save their children they wanted to do and so they did this they they actually paid this guy for this service. And they didn't have any money, really. I mean, they would, in theory, in Nepal, you probably make $250 a year. But they didn't really deal in currency. They dealt in, you know, they would grow the food on their land. And that's what they would eat. And that's how they lived their lives. And they would have to sell their land and maybe sell their house in order to pay for their child to be taken by this guy. When they did that, of course, they'd have to move in with their parents. I mean, not their parents, maybe their parents, but maybe just neighbors or go into debt rest of their lives. But it was worth it to them. And this guy would give them uh, a phone number and say, look, let, let me get settled with your child in Kathmandu. And after two or three months, give me a call. And I'll tell you how your child is doing. So they would wait two or three months. And when that time passed, the father would go to the phone. And that phone was you know, uh, three or four days away or something like that with this phone number, and he'd make this call, and just day after day, call, 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 and nobody would ever answer the phone. And at that moment, they would realize that they had lost their child. And um, you know, it's, uh, like just as an aside, it's um, when I went there, I actually am a father now, and so it didn't, it didn't work out according to plan. I was going to get married and not have kids. But I, which is good, by the way. I don't mean, I always say unfortunately there, but like fortunately, I have a wife and daughter now. Um, but this is actually always the moment now that sort of um, sticks with me, I think, which is that moment of, even, even, if you don't, even if you don't have children, but like imagining this father in this position where he's now learned for sure that their son is gone, that they've given up everything for this privilege of sending their son away, and he has to walk like four days 
you know, to get back to tell his wife, who he knows is looking forward to finally some good news about their son. So, I mean, it's just sort of a devast. I mean, it's, it just must have been a devastating moment for this guy. On the other side, what was happening was that this guy, Golka, this trafficker, would take these kids and essentially abandon them. I mean, he would put them in a room maybe this size, uh, 20 kids, something like that, and just you know, keep them alive, really, on a bowl of rice a day, something like that. And then he could uh, sell them, he could rent them out um, to hotels or other places to wash dishes. And these are young, I mean, these are like six, seven old kids. These are really young kids. He also found that if he sent these kids into like the touristy areas, and came up to people like us who are going to Nepal to, to, to trek, for example, and say, I'm an orphan, do you want to come see my destitute orphanage? And of course, you've just spent $2,000 coming to Nepal to trek. Of course you'd want to help this poor little kid. So you'd go and you'd see this incredibly destitute orphanage, and you'd talk to the you know kind savior who's taking care of all these kids and say, how can I help? And he's like, well, we just need donations, so you give him 100 bucks. And that's like six months' salary that the trafficker now goes in his pocket. So it was an incredibly lucrative way of you know using these kids. Um, it's actually started to get even worse uh, recently. I don't know um, if you have any sort of experiences with adoption, but um, almost every country in the world now has shut down adoption to Nepal just in the last six months because of these very issues. Essentially, what these traffickers would do would be forging death certificates for the families and putting the kids up for adoption to Europe, to North America. And there was no way of really tracking whether these kids were orphans or not. And the reason this is so lucrative is that if you have a children's home and a child gets adopted out of your children's home in Nepal, you get a flat fee of about $5,000. And so these guys were making just unbelievable amounts of money. I mean, you know, you know, by a multiple of 20, what sort of the average salary was in Nepal, just on one child. So you can imagine how lucrative this was. So in this context, um, we now know that the kids are not orphans. We now know that they have families. So th there's not really a lot we can do about it. It was sort of both a great day and a kind of a, a sad day, actually, because um, I knew that they had families, which is great. I also knew that I couldn't get to them because a, a colleague of mine had actually tried to travel outside the Kathmandu Valley just to find the villages of the kids, just to see if they had any living relatives or anything else. And she was, a, she was abducted probably within a week or so. I mean, that's how quick the mouses work, because then they can get a ransom for you and everything. So there was nothing to do. Now, we knew that this mother was living on the other side of Kathmandu. And so we thought, well, at least we can take her two kids and visit their mother. And we thought, this is a good thing. you know. And the other kids were kind of excited about it. They were sort of living vicariously. And we started to take the kids over there. And one day, we went over to this mother who was living in this little shack. And we found that she had seven kids kind of stuck in this little shack where she was living. And she told us that these kids had been also trafficked by this guy, Golka, and just dumped with her and said, take care of these kids. Because he had made money already you know, on sort of the front end of it. And these kids were just, they were, they were starving. I mean, they'll pop up at some point here. Um, and so what we started to do was just feed them, bring them rice and everything else. But we thought, we have to get them a more permanent solution. I mean, we can't fit them in our children's home because we were busting at the seams and we were afraid the government would shut us down if we were overcrowded, which is sort of ironic. So we found this organization called Umbrella Foundation. It was run by a nice couple named Viva and Jackie. And they said, yes, we will definitely take these kids in. And so we're like, great. They, let's see, so I, let me get the timing right here. So that was happening. The Maoists, meanwhile, say, okay, we're putting an end to this civil war now. It's April 2006. We're coming into Kathmandu, which is kind of a terrifying thing. It's been 10 years of civil war. And they said, we're going to shut down the entire country until the king gives up the throne. The king is obviously saying, I'm never going to give up the throne. So what you have is the entire country shut down. Nobody allowed to drive, open stores, open schools, or anything else. People that do are you know, pulled out of their taxis, beaten to death. And uh, and the people are like, this is enough. We're actually going to side with the mouse. We're going to get the king out of power. So it's very similar to the images that we saw in, coming out of Egypt over the last few weeks, which just the people just take to the streets. The ruler's like, I'm calling a curfew. Nobody can go out on the streets. The people come out anyway. 
the ruler says in this case, we're going to shoot to kill any protesters on the street. The people come out anyway. And he lines up the soldiers, and they just start firing into the crowd, and they just start killing protesters on the street. And there's, you know, we'll see what happens in Libya, but there's almost no quicker route to his own demise as a monarch killing his own citizens. I mean, at that point, you've pretty much written your own death warrant. So I got one of the last flights out of Nepal. All these kids we you know, left in the hands of our local staff, which we were very happy about. And I got back to New York, and I was feeling, you know, to be honest, pretty good, pretty good about myself. I, you know, I kind of thought at first that I was volunteering, and I thought, this is going to be a nice thing to put on the TV and everything else, and it's going to be a nice thing to, you know, talk about at dinner parties and everything. But at that point, I felt like I'd actually really done something. Like there were seven kids, and I said, look, you guys are going to get rescued. Somebody's coming for you, and these kids were. I mean, they were off the map. They were off the radar. There was nobody that knew they existed, and they were starving to death. And so. Um, I said, you know what, I've actually been able to do something for these kids. And I'm back in New York, watching all this unfold, watching the people essentially, you know, uh, get to the walls of the palace and the king finally giving up, sort of like it was either that or literally be pulled out of the palace, I think. And all of a sudden you see this kind of euphoria, again, like we saw in Egypt. And all of a sudden people are like, wow, everything's great. And so I was watching all this unfold on CNN. And then I got this email. And this is the only part of the book that I'm actually going to read, because when I was out there, I was taking a lot of notes. I was keeping a blog, um, because I was trying to raise money for the kids and everything else. And so these are all the notes, essentially, that I was taking throughout this thing. So um, just to give you a sense of the characters here, Farid was a young French guy that I was volunteering with. He helped do all this. Viva and Jackie were the ones from Umbrella Foundation and Gold God, obviously, is this trafficker. The email was from Viva Bell. With the uprising, it had taken their team three weeks to get across town to pick up the children. It had been impossible to move in Kathmandu before that. Nothing could ply the roads. Once the king was overthrown, it took them just two days to organize a small van to get the children. Jackie, Viva's partner, went with two of the staff, two women who could comfort the children when they were picked up. Jackie found the shack without any problem. The directions were perfect. He opened the gate. Greed, uh, greeted Doraj's mother and her young son with a smile and walked inside the shack. The seven children were gone. The mother told Jackie that Golka had gotten word that the children were going to be rescued. Golka somehow knew my name, and he knew that I had been speaking to the government's child welfare board about the children and their plight. Golka knew exactly how to exploit the law to remain out of jail, but he recognized that these seven children, their very existence because of the conditions in which they lived, could be used as evidence against him. This, by the way, is that shack, and those are the seven kids that found. Golka took no chances. The moment the king was overthrown and the curfews lifted, he struck. He took the children away, these children, under the cover of a euphoric capital. He kidnapped them so they could not create problems for him. And in a race for the children, he'd beaten Umbrella by 48 hours. And just like that, they'd vanished. Haunting me were the last words I'd said to the children before I left them. I told them that somebody was coming for them, somebody who they could trust. Somebody who would take them to a safe place where there would be many children, where they could go to school and be well fed and sleep in beds and have proper shoes. But they didn't believe it. They'd heard this before from their mothers and their fathers in the villages in Humla, right before they were taken and abandoned and left without food or proper shelter. I sat beside them and looked them in the eye and told them I understood. I promised them that this time it was true. And three weeks later, somebody did come for them, just as I had promised. But not to take them to a safe place. Amida and Durga and little Bishnu and the others, they would all know by now that I had betrayed them. That I was just like the others. The only difference, as I was all too aware, was that this time, nobody knew where they were. I read and reread that email from Viva, sitting in the same bedroom where I had spent much of my childhood. Next to my computer, I kept a notebook of my job search. It was meticulously organized, the sign of my excitement. The prospect of rejoining this life in New York was a dream. It was a life where I had friends and money and dates and food that I had been craving for the past year. And I would be in America, near my family, where everybody spoke English and where we shared a common history and cultural references. I took one last look at the pages of the list of institutes and companies who I thought I might work for, of the pros and cons of each, and I tore those pages out. And on a fresh sheet of paper, I wrote down the names of those seven children. I turned back to my laptop and composed an email to Farid. I explained what had happened, 
including the entire text of Eva's email. I ended my message with a single line, I'm going back to Nepal. He responded immediately from France, I'm coming with you. And the point of, of reading that particular section is because um, I, did, I did go back to Nepal, and uh, I did start searching for these children, and there was no real way to find them. I mean, they were just, they were lost. And they were lost in an incredibly chaotic city of a million people. There was hundreds of thousands of displaced people from the war. There's, you know, obviously no internet. There's no way to track anybody. You just have to start searching house to house, orphanage to orphanage. You have to sort of like listen to anybody that may have seen kids that look like this. Um, I went into dozens and dozens of children's homes, illegal children's homes, where kids were starving looking for these kids. And I walked back out again because those kids weren't there. And I left kids there. And, um, and the reason I did that, and the reason I kept doing it, was because I had taken responsibility for these kids. But more, I had said, look, you know, somebody's, somebody's coming. You know, and don't worry. Somebody's going to come, and they're going to say, come with me. It's OK. And when that happens, go with that guy. And the guy that came in was a child trafficker. And um, so when people, so as you can imagine, with, with a book like this, there's a lot of people that say, oh, you've done such great work. This is amazing what you've done. You're a real philanthropist, everything else. Well, I mean, what would you have done in that situation? You know, I mean, volunteering is not a big deal. You go out and you volunteer, and then you sort of get a little more involved and a little more involved. And if you found out that the lives of these seven kids were now lost because, directly because of what you did, I mean, what, what would you do? And this is sort of the point of the book, I hope, which is, this is not about somebody that goes out and saves the world. This is about somebody who screws up so badly that kids' lives are almost lost because of it. And he's trying to right that situation, bring it back to normal. That's all. So um, I searched for the kids for 10 months. And one by one, I started to find them. Um, some of the photos in there are when I actually found the kids. Uh, I also realized that I was going to have to actually start finding the families of these kids because there was no way of um, protecting these kids unless they were back with their families. And for the first time with the war over, I thought that I could get into these mountains. And so I started talking with a lot of big organizations saying, look, this is what we have to do. This is the only future for these kids. And they said, great. How are you going to do that? And I'm like, I have no idea. That's kind of why I'm sitting here right now talking to you. And they said, well, we don't have any program for that. You know, CARE, UNICEF, all these big organizations. And so I did the only thing that I, I the thing to do, which was fly a plane as deep into the Himalaya as I could, into the sort of last flat strip of ground, and just start walking. You know, put a backpack on, take photos of the kids, and just start walking for weeks. And it, it didn't go very, very smoothly. I mean, I you know got hurt, and I got snowed in, and uh, a lot of bad things happened. But and you know, and by the way, there's like malice, and there's the traffickers who are tracking me through the mountains, which I didn't learn until later. But you know, one by one, we started to find the families of these kids, and that's an extraordinary moment when you come to a village, and people are like, "What is this pale dude doing here?" And you know, you come out with a photo of this child that they haven't seen in years. It's sort of an extraordinary thing. So that became the focus of this small organization that I started called Next Generation Nepal. That is sort of where this book starts in a way, I mean, sort of the adventure of finding the kids, the adventure of finding the families and everything else, and just what happens with the kids and everything else. Um, and uh, you know, I think that in the end, um, you know, I wasn't going to write this book. I uh, was very busy at the time, as you alluded to. I was at business school at the time, which was just killing me. And I, was, I, I met my wife, actually, through this whole process. She came out to volunteer. I was stuck in the mountains when she visited. I had to like do some stupid things to get back to meet her, but that worked out very well. Uh, you know, and we were expecting a son and everything, and I was just like, I'm not going to write this book. And they said, look, you should really write it. Because I'd written this really long blog. And eventually, it was Christmas break, and the, the agent who had sort of been, um, I don't want to say pursuing me, because it sounds like I'm being pursued. But you know, but she was like, I really encourage you to write this story. And so I did finally um, do it. And I did it for two reasons. I mean, first of all, because Nepal is a place where I don't think too many of us know too much, maybe people do. I, I didn't know anything about it. It's also kind of trafficking that I don't think we know much about, like trafficking for institutionalization rather than for 
sexual trafficking or something else. And this is a, also a hideous thing. This is where children are dying because of this. And I think more over, I, I felt like, um, as I was sort of alluding to, you know, I've read a lot of these types of books. You know, I was desperate not to write like a cause book about Nepal. I wanted to tell a, a story about these kids because they're real kids. And I read these books, and um, and I just read like an advanced copy of another book, which I won't, I won't name. But I, I wrote a good blurb for them. But it is one of these books where the person's just like, I just want to help the world, and I want to go out, and I'm going to change the world. And uh, I just wasn't that person, and I want people to sort of read this and be like, wow, if this person could go out and do that, then really anybody can go out and do this. I mean, it's not the volunteer. You don't have to be compassionate and passionate and everything else to go out and volunteer. You have to just go out and volunteer. And that is what gives you the passion, and that's what gives you the compassion, and that's what gives you the skills to actually be able to make a difference. And it allows you to come back as an ambassador for a part of the world or a part of your population here, you know, here in Cambridge or in Boston where you know, these are disenfranchised people who need people to know what's going on in their lives, and that's what volunteering to me is all about. And that's it. It's, it's no more than that. I don't think we have any responsibility past that. It's on our own conscience, but I do think we have a responsibility to see it. So that's really all I wanted to say. So um, thanks for having me. And I can, I'm happy to take questions. I'm sure you're all very busy. Um, I have a question. Yeah. How did you decide that you wanted to go to Nepal? How did you get involved with the orphanage? Yeah, so I um, I decided on Nepal because I knew I wanted, I was kind of a big trekker, I loved to trek, and so I thought Nepal just looked glorious for trekking. It was also going to be one of my first stops, so when I decided to volunteer there, I thought, I really want to get it out of the way. Like, I don't want to have it hanging over me like, oh my gosh, because after that I was going to Thailand, and Thailand was going to rock. I knew this, right? So I was just going to be hanging on beaches and drinking for three months, and I thought, why not get it out of the way? So it was a little bit more accidental than anything. So I literally went on, and I used a search engine called Google, and I looked up, you know, volunteering opportunities in Nepal, and this organization came up. But I think that there's a lot of ways to find it. I mean, I know Lonely Planet has a whole book on volunteering, um, and I hope more organizations are getting the word out because there are volunteering kind of brokers. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I just mean that they help you find volunteering opportunities. Um, but if you can correct, connect directly with the local organization, more of the money goes directly to them, and it's sort of a better. Fit.